Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of Turnkey Talks. My name is Kelly Lewis, and I serve as Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Turnkey Search. Before we jump into our conversation, I want to first acknowledge our newest members and organizations who have joined us within the last month. Thank you and welcome to the assembly. I also want to give our founding members a special thanks for joining us in the first month and the Dallas Mavericks for the seed funding to get the assembly launched. And for those of you who have not joined just yet, we invite you to get involved. So what exactly is the assembly? It is the first and only member-led organization for people who work in professional sports at teams, leagues, and unions. Our purpose is simple. We exist to champion the advancement of diverse and inclusive leadership, which ties directly into our next, our next session discussion. According to the most recent government estimates, African-Americans represent, represents about 13.4% of the US population. Despite years of diverse programs and Sacramento's pledges by corporate America, the C-suite severely lacks black representation, especially at the chief executive level. Recent data shows nearly 60% nearly of black executives who oversee major lines of business at Fortune 500 companies but they had to work twice as hard and accomplish twice as much to be seen on the same level as their colleagues. About half of those leaders talk explicitly about confronting unfair treatment and microaggressions. Close to 60% 60, 60 of black executives say had said that they had to repeatedly perform in tough assignments before they can climb the corporate ladder. And at the same time, many of their coworkers on the other hand, seem to be judged based off potential and given opportunities based on the perceived ability, a pattern we similarly found in women CEOs and executives. Climbing to the CEO ranks is a challenging enough experience, but even more of a fight for black leaders. Despite all the hardship, our next speaker has succeeded to the most senior ranks within a business. Before I turn it over to our moderator, Rick, we invite your questions. Please submit in the question and answer or chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the panel, we will go ahead and review those questions. To make sure the chat is still working, please go ahead right now and tell us where you're viewing from and what organizations you represent. Thank you so much, Rick. We're excited to hear from you and Howard today. Thanks, Kelly. It's a pleasure to be with you all today here in snowy New Jersey. Um, before we get started and, and before I bring Howard on stage here, uh, I'd like to showcase a video uh, detailing what three, C360 is all about. Immersive video is changing everything and C360 is changing immersive video. At 4.2 pounds, it's the world's lightest pro-grade 360 camera. A single anamorphic lens captures 6K and higher images from a single point solution. Direct output to your backhaul for linear broadcast, EVS and Everts replay integration, and simultaneous 4K streaming for OTT VR applications means operators and viewers never miss a thing. There's a reason we play, drive, Watch, study, learn, on the track, or in the ring, or on the battlefield. Anticipation is the name of the game. What we need is vision. What we want is the feeling. And it happens in a moment. With C360, everyone gets the feeling. Everyone gets their moment. Ask us about our next revolution. C360, a video revolution. Again, I'm Rick Alessandri, Managing Director of Media and Sports Tech at Turnkey Search, and pleased to be joined by Howard Wright, who should be joining us any moment. Hey, Rick. Welcome, Howard. Well, you know, it's not an easy leap to go from playing professionally in sports to ascending to the C-suite. Uh, it's even more difficult, as Kelly just outlined, for persons of color. Uh, and yet, that's exactly what you've done. Um, thrilled to be joined by my friend and current 
CEO of, of C360, Howard Wright. Howard's a former Stanford MBA and international basketball player. Um, and as the lead recruiter on the search for C360, I can tell you it was a very competitive and highly skilled group of candidates. What became clear throughout the process was Howard's incredible experience coupled with his competitive spirit made him a perfect choice to lead this sports tech company into the future. I'd like to welcome my friend and current CEO, Howard Wright. Thanks for having me, Rick. That uh, green screen looks really sharp behind you. <laughs> Our team does a great job. Um, Howard, let, let's start at the beginning. Um, you know, I've heard you on a bunch of different podcasts and we've talked about it in the past. Obviously, family as evidenced by your credenza behind you with all those wonderful, beautiful photographs is really important to you. Um, how did you get here today? Give us a little bit about your path. Um, in one of the podcasts I've heard you speak about, you were the least accomplished right in your family. You've got siblings who have been in accounting, law, medical industry. Um, that said, I think your CEO title today puts you right up there with the rest of your, uh, your family members. I'm not sure. I'd like to think that I would get invited to the family reunion uh, next summer, but it's not just my immediate siblings, Rick. It is my uh, nieces and nephews and my oldest daughter, all of whom who have advanced degrees. So basically, my ceiling, which was graduating from Stanford University, is and was my daughter's floor. She graduated from undergraduate at Stanford, then went on to Stanford Law School, honors and distinction, and then on to what she's doing for the federal government right now. So the, it was a really the pull of my mother's hope. All of us lived in fear of my father, who was a all-world football player and played for the Chargers and the Bengals. But we always, as children, never wanted to disappoint our mother. And our mother, uh, she judged our successes not by points and rebounds or receptions. She judged it by GPA and SAT scores. And so she used to make us go to the library in the summertime when we were kids. And we thought that was cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> Well, she certainly um, has a lot to be um, proud about. I mean, you and your siblings have really achieved great success. But talk about your journey from, you know, from high school to college and then ultimately to playing professional sports and then obviously your professional career. I, I deliberately did not introduce your background because really I think your story is so incredible. I'd like you to kind of take, take the group through it. Sure. Uh, born and raised in San Diego um, was a Pretty good uh, high school basketball player, uh, good grades, good SATs, good citizenship. I was a low risk student athlete <laughs> recruit for you know some major programs. After many uh, schools called, it just, I got fixated on Stanford very early in the process, committed in my senior year. We were there for four years. I went there to go to school. I went there to be prepared for the job that I have now. A uh, funny thing happened along the way, Rick, is I kept getting a little bit bigger and a little bit better. And I was lucky enough to have a short and non-illustrious career in the NBA. It was a fulfillment of a childhood dream, but it surprised me in many ways in that I was going to a world-class um, university to pursue my education. After bopping around in the NBA for a couple, three years, I got an offer to go over to Spain. Uh, and then after that, it was Italy and, and a few more. And they kept paying me hundreds of thousands of dollars to play basketball. And so I kept, you know, cashing those checks. And then about year nine, year 10, I said, yeah, I'm ready to go do something else. I had gotten to the height of what my athletic ability would allow me to uh, achieve. I had experiences, friends, relationships that uh, are, you know, once in a lifetime, I still consider, consider myself one of the luckiest guys in the world. And I was ready to then pursue gold in corporate America. And, and talk about that first role. You know, how did, how, how did you prepare yourself for life beyond, you know, playing professional basketball? Uh, if you compare me to my classmates from Stanford in the same class, I probably lost money by going into <laughs> playing 
professional basketball as those the kids and my peers were starting companies and working right there in Silicon Valley with RSUs and peers and grants in the early days. Uh, when I came back to San Diego, I said, you know what, let me go to business school so I can restart my academic career. Lo and behold, meet Paul Jacobs, who uh, comes in as a entrepreneur's breakfast or lunch and told us all the things that were going on at Qualcomm. Paul at the time was a VP or SVP. He was clearly the heir apparent to his father who founded the company, uh, Erwin Jacobs. And I just found it so fascinating, the crispness in his vision, Rick, the intentionality of what Qualcomm was going to do over the next decade, that I went up to him after the class and said, uh, hi, I'm Howard Wright. <clears throat> I am not really qualified to do much, sir, but I will work my ass off for you in a nutshell. He took my resume and put it into the system that uh, Qualcomm at HR. And I had, I think I only had, had uh, 12 interviews over four or five days. And uh, I was hired at Qualcomm. This is like 2000. So I owe a professional debt of gratitude uh, to Paul Jacobs that I may never be able to repay. After, after Qualcomm, you, you made another move uh, to another major tech company. Talk about that progression. Sure. Uh, Peggy Johnson, who was my immediate boss, she had left uh, Qualcomm six months before that. Paul was an executive uh, chairman, but uh, not spending as much time at the company as he did in the past. And the company didn't feel the same to me. And again, my oldest daughter was at Stanford. It's the chance to come back to the Bay Area. I got recruited from uh, Intel. There may be an offer that I couldn't refuse. And I loved being in high tech, representing some of the most uh, iconic badges in the world. Uh, these companies are synonymous with you know, with ruthless execution of technology at all process nodes. And it was intellectually intriguing for me. It was wonderful to be a part of another big blue chip Fortune 100 company. And all of that, that prepares you for, um, I found, found that fascinating. And so we spent five years there. Well, you, you talk a lot about, you know, I've heard you talk often about Paul Jacobs and Peggy and, and others, Bill Koenig and others th throughout your career who have had, a, it, it, had an influence and support system. Yeah. How important are those professional, you know, those mentors or professional sponsors and what role should they play? What role do you play to younger colleagues coming up in the industry? How, how do you balance that and what, what support do you provide? Yeah, so I think they're even more critical now in this time of COVID, in this time of pandemic. And one of them years and years ago told me to build your own board right now. So I obviously have a board at C360. I'm responsible of fiduciary responsibilities, responsibilities to the staff and to the board. But my own personal board of folks that I can uh, seek advice from, folks that can offer um, you know, quiet critiques and criticisms and uh, suggestions. I started building that a long time ago um, and I found it to be invaluable. That board, there are no meetings, they don't get paid, <laughs> there's no uh, uh, boondoggles to Pebble Beach. They just are in touch with me at periodic times of the week or the month. And I get to learn from literally some of the best and most authentic leaders in the world. Now, I would, you know, I don't want it to be a, a non-humble brag. So I prefer not to say all the names, but all those names also became references for jobs that I was being interviewed for and the references for this job also. That board allowed me to, you know, design a graceful exit from Intel Corporation to spend some quality time with my family this summer. And then obviously you get a chance to unleash the full potential of C360 as we're trying to do right now, Rick. When you think about the challenges that African-American leaders, especially today, face, um, does that board, personal board, become even more important? And how diverse should your board be? Yeah, so my board is extraordinarily diverse for lots of different reasons. 
and it is it was it was by design. Um, what happens now is uh, we're seeing a kind of a retrenchment, almost a, a recoiling from some of the days of Ursula Burns and Ken Chenault and some of the this, the most iconic leaders and CEOs in the world that just oh by the way happen to be African American. Now those numbers are dwindling, and corporate America is trying to make some changes. Some are being sincere, some are being less than fully sincere. And this, I compare Rick pretty much to, if you think about back in the eighties and what folks said about the black quarterback in the NFL, but just the eighties, it's just, you know, a decade or two behind us. And the insidious little racist terms that implied that somebody was lacking intellect or leadership or the ability to make a you know call an audible that quarterback is really the face of the franchise it's the face of the city it represents the uh, franchise in a very meaningful way if you think about those of the 80s that was the warren moons and the doug williams and when they got a chance what did they do they were extraordinary and Doug Williams in the Super Bowl and Warren Moon throughout his career and going on to the Hall of Fame. If you fast forward to now, it is, oh, Patrick Mahomes and Russell Wilson and Deshaun Watson and Lamar Jackson. It's almost unremarkable that, yes, if you give the best player the chance to succeed at the highest level, Darwinism always takes over and you will find that. I think that's what we're going to see with the black CEO is that hopefully we'll look back maybe just a few years from now, maybe not uh, decades from now and say, yeah, that was interesting at the time, but it's unremarkable now. So the, I have a generational responsibility as an African-American CEO that I take very seriously. Uh, it is one of the metrics through which I will be measured. Um, and I know that um, other CEOs and CEO ships could follow as a result of um, success I'm planning to have. You know, yesterday, it, it just so happened, um, yesterday, Intel, yeah. you know, it, it, the, the issue with diversity, especially in the tech industry, is even more exacerbated, right? So Intel has put some commitment behind it, and they released uh, their latest diversity statistics, which showed a mixed bag of, of success and gains and some not, not, not so much gains in some areas relatively flat numbers of black employees and a decline in female representation in the US. Um, their chief, their interim chief diversity and inclusion officer, Don Jones, quote, said, it may be slower than we would like, but at least the conversation is on the table. Yeah. Is the conversation enough? Don't we need more action and less conversation? How, how do you balance that? We need both. So it's an and, not an or, Rick, and it's this long form long form conversation that we're having right now to talk about systemic racism and sexism and it is also more programs initiatives with intentionality with focus and not just platitudes now i do applaud intel for consistently every quarter reporting their numbers to wall street I think eventually most companies will start doing that, but in tech, it has been this dirty little secret for some time. And the idea that um, we can't find them or we don't know where they are, that's um, really disrespectful in so many ways. And I think companies like Intel and others will lead this and lead us out of this really dark portion of what ha what's happening in corporate, corporate America right now. Well, I mean, I, I, I agree completely, especially in sports. We, we keep score. There's, yeah. a, there's a scorecard. Yeah. You know, that's the way you measure success. Um, so I, I'm glad that these tech companies are moving in that direction. Um, and you see the leagues trying to push forward in those directions. And a lot of, of initiatives like the Pro Sports Assembly are providing a platform. But clearly, you need to keep score. You need to track so, it. So I, I want to put an exclamation point on that for you, Rick, which is, uh, the competitiveness that I was probably born with and instilled with is certainly out of this meritocracy. There's no other better place in, in sport, baseball, football, basketball. In the NFL, you have 
QBR and <laughs> NBA's uh, PER player efficiency uh, rating. Those are quantitative, quantifiable numbers and statistics that I can put by. I had this many points, this many rebounds, and I contributed uh, X percent to the win or the loss. And you can do the same. And then when we both come up for a contract, Rick gets X, I get X plus Y, or I get X minus Y. It's based on a system. There's a subjectivity that exists in corporate America that is not based on the meritocracy that we see in professional sports. And as we try to all of us improve and get better, I think that's one of the things that um, you know most of my peers and many of my mentors I uh, got tired of being maybe pigeonholed at a certain level, at a certain status, when they had aspirations to do much more. I think I have a, um, a higher peak than you know some of my past employers might have thought I could achieve myself. Why do you, you know? Why do you think it's essential for companies to employ black people of color, women to hold these key positions? What, what what will they bring? What will you bring to to a leadership role at C360 that's a different perspective or a different lens to it? Yeah, so I'm going to try to um, pivot here, which is let's separate this from an African-American CEO conversating about this. Let's look at the neuroscience that uh, you know, Harvard Medical School and all and the leading institutions around the U.S. and around the world have done studies on this. The teams and the corporations, or SAP, or excuse me, S and P, Fortune 100, Fortune 1000, the teams that have more diversity are higher performing, and so it's really not a question of black or white. It's a question of green. As a shareholder, do you want more shareholder return and value created, more enterprise value created? So the experience is not. Yes, if you hired. 12 African-American males, all my age, all the same school, all the same uh, experiences, you get a microcosm, you get a smaller view. But if you hire different folks from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, if you have different experiences, the IQ in that room, in that boardroom goes up because then you're debating about you know, a higher functioning version of the corporation versus the confirmation bias that exists when 22, you know, um, uh, males get in the room and decide on the same thing. Let's let's, let's pivot to, um, although I hate the P word, I hate the pivot <laughs> word. Um, let, let, let's move to C360. Sure. Um, you know, you've been on the job a couple of weeks now. Congratulations again. Tell us about the company. What is C360? What space do you live in today? Excellent. We are a immersive media creation engine. And when actually you first pitched me this idea, I looked, I took a cursory look and I thought, what do I care about some VR company in the middle of Western Pennsylvania? And then you said something to the effect of, uh, have I ever wasted your time? Take a deeper look and let's get on the conversation with the board. And so thank you for your insistence because I don't know if I was being dismissive or elitist, but it is that second look that allowed me to see not just the commercial success in terms of the pylon cams that you see on Monday Night Football or Sunday Night Football, or you know even some of the college football games that we do. It is a combination of the executive staff and the code and the coders that we have. It's a combination of the defensible IP that already exists at the corporation and the patents that are being filed you know, as we speak. It is this ridiculous board that I get a pleasure to be on and work for, including the investor investment community, which is everybody from you know, Horizon X and the Boeing folks to Blue Tree Capital and 76 Capital, um, and so it's a wide mix. Finally, you know, having the most iconic and important brands in the world as paying customers and co-collaborators of what we could build together in terms of a 2.0 or a 3.0, that's a really unique combination of forces that you know, uh, belong to you know, sports, technology, entertainment, 
and we're right in the middle of it. And so we are an immersive media creation engine and we're not a camera company, we're not a pylon company. The encoding, the decoding, the distribution, the curation of all of these precious images from the networks and from the teams, we curate and then give back to the networks to put either on their, their linear stream, their digital stream, and then eventually it'll go up on social. And so that's the, that was the opportunity. Um, I will say this, which is our aerospace business is just a unknown jewel that we stumbled upon and that by the time I got a chance to really dig into it and talk to our CTO and talk to the young man that leads our aerospace business, it is um, you know, working with multiple three-letter organizations in, in Washington, D.C. I don't have the clearance to tell you all the things that I know, but <laughs> suffice it to say is that we're extraordinarily excited because this, whether it be for a um, something in the field of battle, something at a uh, in an airport or a smart city, smart a smart venue, or something literally on the field or right next to the court, an NFL field or an NBA court. That is where we live and we're gonna give folks these immersive media images in ways they've never seen before. So when you think about that, I mean, I've seen, I can't remember who the player was, but there was, I think it was a Sunday night football game and the players had just scored and literally laid down on the goal line, <laughs> looking straight into pylon cam. When, when that becomes part of the kind of the zeitgeist, when these devices and this immersive experience uh, becomes part of the zeitgeist, what does that do for you as a CEO, when you start to look at that, how do you want to like take advantage of that? How do you want to bring that to consumers in a bigger way, in a faster way? How can you accelerate that kind of growth and, and momentum? That's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to galvanize that momentum. We're trying to weaponize all of these views. Let's be honest, Rick, you and I, in our you know, 30 plus years in the industry and the ecosystem, we've been to every Super Bowl, we've been to every NFL um, playoff game or NBA finals, we've been to the coolest events in the most iconic venues in the world. We're 1% of 1% of 1% of folks that are that lucky. Now, with the advent of the cloud is closer to you, you know, 5G is here, so the network is closer to you, you have you know, cellular speeds as well as uh, wired speeds. You have wide gig and everything else to use so that this device that is typically the 60 inch TV that's sitting in your living room is now with you everywhere that you go. These images that I'm willing to pay for through whichever ESPN plus or whichever um, uh, carrier that I give my, my dollars to is I want more. There's an insatiable demand for viewers and viewerships, unique views, not the 2D flat screen experience, non-interactive experience that we've had this generation, especially this generation, wants to go inside the play. They want the Jack Nicholson view. They want the uh, Spike Lee view. They want to be able to be their own executive producer. And we at C360 have the audacity to think that we can help the immersive media economy build those views for all of us. When you, um, as a new leader coming into a relatively early, still early stage company. They've had tremendous success early on, but still early stage. You're operating from Colorado, they're in Pittsburgh. You're a new CEO coming in. We're in the middle of a pandemic. How do you, what are the leadership skills that you're bringing that you've kind of learned over the years to integrate into this company from a distance? How, how are you managing that process? Yeah, it's through this uh, you know, gigabit connection here in the office and uh, interactivity. Every one of my mentors or the folks that are on my personal board are authentic leaders. Inauthentic folks, people sniff them out and they stop listening very quickly. In a non-COVID world, I would have been, you know, shoulder to shoulder with the team in Pittsburgh working on the next iteration of the, of the um, projects, working on R&D and, and everything else. Right now, we're finding ourselves that, okay, we have to virtualize this. We have to be cognizant of the toxicity of the um, uh, of the um, pathogen here. 
we have to be protected and make sure that we can do everything that we need to do remotely before we get to this you know, post vaccine world. As we're doing that, that actually accelerates some thinking, Rick, in terms of now we have to really globalize ourselves. We're not a regional Pittsburgh company you can only hire kids from CMU. You know, CMU, you know, Carnegie Mellon is one of the world-class organizations in the uh, or universities of the world. And they have engineers with ability uh, that is you know, pouring out of their ears. But now the challenge that we have as executive staff and as CEO is how do we tap into some of these other virtual partners that we could have? There are partners in Seoul that we could work with. There's partners in Tokyo. There's partners in Tel Aviv. There's partners in Austin. There's partners right there in Pittsburgh. So that is what is accelerating uh, our need to be a global player as C360. And that does good for all of us, including uh, our shareholders, because it creates enterprise value for all of us. What uh, what challenges are you facing today in, in this world, in this pandemic? I mean, obviously, challenges create opportunity. Uh, and and you, you and I have talked about this, the fact that there are people sitting home now engaged on their, whether it's their mobile device or whether it's their, you know, 60 inch or 80 inch or 105 inch monitor. What challenges are you addressing today that you might not have faced outside of a pandemic environment that you're trying to figure out how do you create more opportunity around it? In the years past, pre-pandemic, Rick, I think most of the broadcasters, most of the leagues had bigger, healthier budgets. It was, they knew exactly how much they were gonna spend every single year. The, the schism that has been created, these breaks, the bubbles, the, the shutdowns, the delays, have all given a little bit of um, oh apprehension to the broadcasters and, and some of the leagues. So there's less predictability, but it actually plays to our favor because we are so nimble. We're relatively so small. Our the quality and fidelity of our product is just exceptional, as you saw in the uh, in the in the sizzle reel. That it gives us a chance to pick up and be opportunistic. So that is the, how do you navigate this treacherous year of 2021? Keep your employees and your employee base safe and bubbled as best you can. And then to adapt quickly, exert some agility inside of this new normal before we get to the post vaccine world, because you know we're still gonna be there for at least probably six more months. Got it. When you, when you think about, you've worked for some terrific CEOs and have had access to commissioners and, and other CEOs of sports media and tech companies, what do you think are the best kind of personality traits, characteristics that you found in some of those, some of those highly skilled CEOs? I have found that uh, servant leadership is something that resonates with me. It's themed through some of the folks that I most admire. I certainly admire um, you know, the Ken Chenaults and the Steve Jobs and the, and others who are, you know, probably more, you know, bombastic or, um, you know, had more uh, outward enthusiasm. It is kind of the quiet leadership of Tim, Tim Cook. It is some of the other things that I see partners and mentors and some of the CEOs that I admire are doing right now, which is they're playing chess while everybody else is playing checkers. They're thinking four moves ahead, five moves ahead. They're not spending a lot of time thinking about the next week or the next, what is the stock price done today? They are intentional in their thought in that they know that these windows close very quickly in terms of opportunity, which leads us back to, if I don't steal a phrase or a thought from you know, Paul Jacobs or Peggy Johnson or you know, Aisha and some of these folks uh, in what I'm doing every week, then I've had a bad week. One of the leaders that you had the pleasure of working with and engaging with, and unfortunately we um, just passed the one year anniversary of his passing is Commissioner Stern. Um, everyone has a David Stern story. Yeah. Tell us yours. <laughs> I, I have a couple, but the best one is I, I believe I got 
um, a great compliment and the best insult in the same exact phrase. Um, going way back, I was an undrafted rookie and there'd be rookie symposiums and you'd run into Commissioner Stern from time to time. Imagine at the height of his powers, he's dealing with tens, you know, a couple thousand, six, eight black guys that are <laughs> running, jumping, always kind of want something for him, from him. Um, I always paid attention at the symposiums and I always made a point to go by the league office when I was in town. And after my playing career, I went back to the fourth square event in, um, in New York City and saw Commissioner Stern, Commissioner Emeritus at the time there. Um, so I didn't have my name badge on when I was standing in line to get my uh, name badge. And he said, Stanford. So he didn't remember my first name, but he did remember Stanford. And so actually it's kind of a running joke. If, if I see Shaq today, he calls me Stanford. He just probably doesn't know what my first name is. A couple other players called me Stanford. Um, uh, and so I got a chance to reconnect about 10 years ago with Commissioner Stern. And then every time we went to New York, I would come in and show him what we're working on. And so a couple of years ago, it was a the volumetric system and how you uh, create these voxels and move them around. And there's you know, 300 terabytes of data. So I explained all this into it in his office. And without missing a beat, he said, uh, right, you're not nearly as dumb as I feared that you were. And I, you know, I had a bit of a coffee and I spit it out a little bit, but I could not stop laughing because um, it was for those folks that know and knew Commissioner Stern, it was a, just a warm arm hug around me saying, okay, proud of you, what you're doing. But he couldn't bring himself to say that. He just had to throw in, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a kick in the side to keep me humble and to make sure that um, uh, that we both had a story out of that. So that's my favorite Commissioner Stern story. Later that year, he came on and he did a fireside chat with us at Intel Capital at our Intel Capital Summit and class act. Yeah, Rick, we sat there at dinner the, the night before and without intending to drop names, the conversation went from Nelson Mandela to Lech Wałęsa back to MJ, back to Larry Bird, back to the time that he was at such and such prime minister. And I was like, I said, sir, you've got to write a book. You, he said, well, yeah, the people have been trying to get me to do it. I said, please, you know, for us who, I'm probably one of several million folks that call him, uh, uh, called him a mentor. That's a memoir that I would like to see. That's a life well lived. Absolutely, no question about it. Um, when you when you go back to go back to your roots again, um, what what were some of those other lessons that your mom kind of instilled in you um, that that made you that kind of overachiever that made that pushed you towards that education that pushed you to succeed and pushed you into this business world and and, and your success today? She never let us forget that so many of us, and now I'm going to personalize it in terms of. African Americans. So many of us were denied the equality, the opportunity, the access to achieve academically. That, you know, she's the same age as Elizabeth Eckford, who was one of the Little Rock Nine. So if you went to um, um, high school in Ohio, but that's the same year that Little Rock Nine was integrated. So we think about American history or civil rights history as it's in some book that's 4,000 years ago, Rick, that is one generation away. And so that's why all of us, both her children and grandchildren, who have sat at her knee in, you know, for the 81 years, or the 80 years that she's been on the planet, have a insatiable desire to try to please her we never could please her with a car watch or anything that was, um, you know, it, it had to be something meaningful. It was acceptance to a university. It was acceptance to a certain grad, a grad school. It was um, graduation day. 
And so even I remember that graduations were always an important part of our family. And she would drag us all over the country whenever a cousin, brother, nephew, sister, aunt was graduated from something so that they could see that this is what I expect out of this family. And we have not let her down yet. It's awesome. Um, when you when you think about you know your your family life and yeah. the the to to your point your mother's stress on education, um, when you think about your kids, and you've got a continuing growing family, yeah. What what are the lessons you want to impart upon them? Um, I'll start with my oldest daughter, Alyssa. I, I just again I'm kind of in awe of her. I know I'm the father and she's still my baby girl, even though she's 26 years old. <laughs> um, I try to make sure at every turn that she knew that, that, that um, there was no ceiling on her and that to channel and funnel her energy and her intellect and her curiosities and her passions into something that she could be very proud of. It, um, I think we try to do that with the other um, children as well, as my job is not to be a warden, my job is not to be a, a, a librarian, my job is to pass down what has been passed down to me, which is me sitting on my grandmother's leg, me sitting you know, by my mother's uh, side, and this the audacity of the belief in us saying, you know, when I was 11, maybe 12, my grandmother, before she passed, she said, Howard, you're going to sit with, next to uh, presidents and prime ministers and kings and queens, and you're going to travel the world and your children are going to do this. And I was like, I'm, I'm 11. How do you <laughs> see that? And there was this prayers that she sent generations ahead for us that, um, you know, actually is the highest version of ourselves. And so all of us have still been trying to find and pursue that highest version of ourselves in honor of our um, mothers and grandmothers. And so that's what I'm trying to do with, with, with our kids as well. Um, before, we, before we finish, um, there's one story that I absolutely love that you tell for this sports group that we have here today is talk about your... Uh, First time you, you you put it through the hoop in a professional NBA game. Oh, you get four or five hours. I've been doing this for a long time. So uh, this is 1990s, my rookie year. I'm an undrafted uh, kind of peon uh, in Atlanta. That team was Doc Rivers, Dominique Wilkins, uh, Kevin Willis, Moses Malone. Those were those teams that always went to the Eastern Conference Finals, but always lost to Bird. I mean, just legendary teams. I spent the entire summer in Atlanta working out three times a day in preparation for um, you know, veterans camp. So I do very well in veterans camp and they keep me. And so now it is opening night and um, Kevin Willis gets two fouls in about four minutes. And so Rick, I am so nervous I don't know what to do. This is the most nervous I've ever been in my life. I intentionally didn't have my college girlfriend with me there. I didn't have any, my mother, father, my brother. I didn't want anybody to, to be there because I didn't know that I was actually going to make the team until the day before. So now I get in the game. I know it's a, one of those Thursday night games. So I know my father is watching. I know my mother is watching. Um, I've always, had always tried to prove myself to my father. My father was an old school um, Midwest guy, he always kept his, I don't know, his, uh, his love just kind of out, just outside of his reach so that we would aspire to do more. I get in the game uh, against Orlando. Dennis Scott goes baseline. Uh, he doesn't see me. I get up and I block a shot. Block the shot, turn and throw it to Doc Rivers, and I run as fast as I can up the right side of the court. Doc fakes it to... Uh, Dominique, who's running up the left side, I don't know why he would do that, leaves it for me. So I go in, I am fouled by Terry Catledge. I, in the game, I now have uh, a block shot, a rebound, 
a basket, and now I'm going to the free throw line, and I'm ice cold, and I'm petrified. I'm like, I've never been a great free throw shooter to begin with, Rick, but I'm thinking to myself, Lord, just let me hit some part of that structure up there, the rim, the backboard, the 24 second clock, let me just hit something. Is that moment, I went through my routine, my older brother, Ernie, when we used to go to the park, we were playing as kids, would take me through the routine. He prepared me for the moment that was in front of me right then. Through the routine, three bounces, follow through, switch. Now I've been in the game, two minutes, three points, you know, two rebounds and, and a block. I come out uh, um, after a few minutes and Kevin Willis goes back in. Now I had better games than that. I had 13 points against the Clippers and I had 10 points against the Warriors and you know, I had some decent games. That opening night, that's seared into my memory because it really was, you know, from the time I was 11, what I prepared um, my body and my mind to do. And that was the prayer when I was a little kid. And, you know, God allowed me to, you know, fulfill that. So it was a greater than my wildest dreams. And, um, yeah, I think about that every once in a while. That's great. Um, finally, what's one piece of practical advice that you would give to many of the folks on this uh, webinar today as they start their professional careers or in the midst of, of a burgeoning sports career? Build your own board right now. I don't care if you're 23. I don't care if you're 33. I am 53. Build your own board right now. Now, board members will come in and come out, but you need a nucleus. You need a strong core of folks that can be objective, that can give you advice, that can be critical, and that can, you know, we also present you with opportunities above your current station. Do not waste their time, um, as I try not to waste my board's time. And for those who, you know, probably consider themselves a mentee to me, they know better than to waste my time. Build your board right now so that when the moment comes, you already have folks that have prepared you for the moment that's ahead. Great. Kelly Kelly has joined us again uh, and, and probably has some questions from our uh, attendees today. I do. And Howard, to that point, I can't stress enough the importance of a board. I have a professional board of directors as well as a, per a personal one. And they have been very instrumental in me getting to where I am today. And so that kind of pivots us to our first question that we have from individuals in the audience. And so the question is, when you were a player, what were the most important aspects and or people in your learning and business of basketball and professional sports? Where were you spending your time to cultivate these relationships? Was it inside the coaching staff or outside that led you to where you are today? We spent a lot of time with the assistant coaches. And I think most folks or most, most fans only recognize that it's you know Doc Rivers for this or Steve Kerr for the other thing. The assistant coaches spend an inordinate amount of time with the players, prepping in the summer, uh, before the game, after the game. Uh, you fly into a city, you get there early, and you know maybe it's one on one, maybe it's you know one coach and three or four players. Those coaches, assistant coaches, who ultimately become head coaches, see who authentically wants to be great. There is no way to hide <laughs> in terms of effort on a you know, six o'clock workout uh, uh, on the time sheet. And if you don't or you don't, at that level in professional sports, just like in corporate America, everybody has talent. There's plenty of talent. Everybody's more talented than, than, than I am. Very few have worked, very few can outwork me. And so the analogy that I would draw is, are you only want to, you know, show the head coach what you're doing during the game? Do you only want to show the CEO how important you are during that key board meet, meeting? Show the representatives around, show the senior staff, show the lieutenants and the generals and show the assistant coaches that you appreciate the opportunity and that you're sincerely in pursuit of excellence in your craft. Thank you. And so as you're talking about this concept of outworking the competition, right? 
What yeah. exactly is that for you? Is that taking the initiative, creating your own projects? Let's dive a little deeper into that. And so it's a work ethic that comes from the family, comes from the father, grandfathers, and, and others. Um, I never was, I can't, I don't sleep very well to begin with, and so I'm usually up pretty early. And during those times, I'm ideating, I'm strategizing with either key staff uh, members, uh, potential investors, you know, I'll, I'll run an idea as Rick and some of the folks that, you know, we're connected with, we're planning past this immediate next quarter. And so our 2021 is not, you know, set in stone or, or is a bait, but we're already planning for not just the next three weeks, the next three quarters and the next three years. Mm -hmm. That requires cognitive thought, like the synapses fire, and then just don't live in your own world. Bounce these sometimes radical ideas off folks whose opinion you trust and their business and technical acumen um, is, is proven. Awesome. And so our next question is focusing a little bit more on your role currently. And the question is, how ready are your existing and potential partners to use this integrated product to service at 360? How do you manage your business development process? I'll answer the second one first, which is we um, put our customers on a pedestal. Our existing customers, we aim to delight them every single time, every single game, every single stream, every single um, pixel. Word of mouth and having the, you know, basically the ability to say what we're going to do and do that exact thing gives us credibility in the ecosystem. It gives us credibility with our partners. So we are maniacally focused on delighting our customers. The second part, or excuse me, the first part, second now is once you're inside of that trusted thought chamber, you can strategize, you can ideate with the partners for the next initiatives, the next embellishments to the platforms that they want to choose. Almost everyone recognizes that, okay, how do I produce more streams, more revenue, more unique and differentiated content? And a company like C360, like ours, is in prime position to go up the stack and do that for multiple partners in the immersive media economy. If I can just jump in there, Kelly, one second. What Howard just described, um, Howard and I met each other 2003 when I was working on a lot of the ESPN wireless business and, and Howard was at Qualcomm. And, what he just described was exactly the way he approached ESPN with his outstanding kind of customer service and approach to partners. Um, so that's been consistent throughout his career. And one of the reasons why he's such a tremendous fit at C360, you know, I think as recruiters, as you know, we try to put together the right people with the right company, the right mm -hmm. culture. And I think that's exactly what we found here is that this, is, this has been Howard Wright and now he fits nicely into what C360 is bringing to market. Awesome. And so just being mindful of your time here, we're gonna leave you with one question, which is very ambiguous, right? And so as we think about this final question, Howard, what is one thing that we might not have asked that you wish we would have asked throughout this conversation that you wanna underscore and highlight before we let you go? What do you want you to ask? Um... No, I, I, I believe that you gave us the proper platform to talk about you know, those who came before us, especially me, and the debt that I owe to them and how to pay it forward to this next generation. And now I'm not trying to be exclusionary, but I am talking about specifically African-Americans, URMs, females, that there is there are other challenges that majority males have overcome, racism just hasn't been one of them, or sexism just hasn't been one of them. They are not my enemy, they are my partner. We are going to get all to a higher uh, state of enlightenment by working together. 
as opposed to going through the extremes of you know either side and yelling and screaming at each other. This I don't think we're going to have an epiphany moment where you know the pixie dust is cleared and racism is over and sexism is over. I think there's going to be a gradual allyship, and we're going to appreciate each other. And I'm going to challenge my friends and allies to challenge me to be the highest version of myself, and I'm going to challenge them to be the highest version of themselves. Well, thank you. And I want to thank Rick and Howard, as well as those in the audience, for being here with us today. Um, and as we think about this programming, our classes are free, but our content will soon be transitioning to members only. If you haven't gotten involved with the assembly, we do encourage you to do it so. And remember that allyship is not just a word or a noun, but also a verb. And so as we close, we're gonna have a 60 second video, 60 second video from the Pro Sports Assembly, really detailing what our organization is and what we represent. Have a great day.